Life is fragile. It's a fact we're learning in real time. Our usual day-to-day has evolved into this odd chaos. Peace is becoming obsolete. Many have lost jobs, security, and those they love. The pain is undeniable. But what if our fragility caused us to lean harder into God? What if, in our weakness, we chose to rely more on His strength? Would our outlook change? Would the peace that passes understanding begin to drown out the noise of this moment? Would we walk in a quiet confidence, knowing our God is mighty to save? Yes, life is fragile. But in our weakness, He is strong. Good morning and welcome to this week's online service. We're so glad that you have joined with us today. Now take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, as we this morning look at the theme of peace in the midst of a pandemic. Peace in the midst of a pandemic. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes to the Church of Philippi. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And if you do that, here's what's going to happen in verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Mental health experts have labeled this pandemic This time is the age of anxiety. It would appear as though nearly everyone is worrying about something. Millions of children go to bed at night. They're worried about their personal safety. Parents worry about their ability to protect their children and to provide for them in the midst of this pandemic. Employees wonder if they'll have a job and they're worrying about it. Employers, they worry about opening and keeping their doors open. Students, they worry about passing the online classes that they've never experienced before. Singles, they're lonely and they're trying to find their way during this time of being separated from others and it's a difficult time for many. And they're wondering, will I ever get married? Will I ever have a a home where there's a family? Is that in the future or not? The aged, they're worrying as well. They're wondering if this pandemic will affect their finances and how it will, and will they have the finances necessary to go off into their golden years of retirement? Friends, simply put, there's just a whole lot of worrying going on. Anxiety, worry, and fret. If you'll begin to look around, you'll discover that it's no respecter of age because the small children to the oldest adult, they're all in the same boat together in this thing called worry. And makes no difference of the station of life, no matter whether the president of a corporation or whether they are in school. A physician and author by the name of A.J. Cronin He chronicled and analyzed the key anxieties and worries of his patients. He did so to see if he could better understand the anatomy of what it is to be full of worry and how this worrying stresses out the entire body and one's mind. Here's what he discovered. People were literally worrying themselves sick over nothing. You heard me and you heard me right. They were literally worrying themselves sick over nothing. Here's what he discovered. 92% of all the things the patients worried about never materialized. They never came to pass. Health worries, family worries, financial worries. It was all a big stew about absolutely nothing because in the end, after all their worrying, all their fretting, all their stress, all their sleepless nights, they came to realize what they were worrying about never came to pass. Let me illustrate this for you for a moment. 
A few years ago, my son John and I were returning from a week of ministry with Global University in Istanbul, Turkey. As we were coming back to the United States, we first landed at New York, and it was from New York we were going to catch our flight, which was going to connect in uh, Cleveland, and then from Cleveland on to Milwaukee. Due to some air traffic control problems, we sat on the runway there in New York for two hours. Now we understood, we knew that it was going to be a tight connection, even if everything was working well. And uh, as I was sitting there on the tarmac, here's what I began to do. I began to use my time wisely. I began to worry and I began to fret what we would do if we missed our flight in Cleveland, from Cleveland to Milwaukee. And seeing especially that our flight from Cleveland to Milwaukee was the last of all the flights for the day, I began to go through my um, online, uh, you know, just looking to see if I could find any kind of a upcoming uh, flight. And realizing that more than likely we'd miss our flight for the night, I was looking for flights for the next morning. And um, not only looking for flights, I was looking for a place to spend the night. And after I had found what I thought could be a workable solution for early morning flight, having missed our flights in Cleveland, um, I leaned over to John and I said to John, I said, here's what I have found. I have found a flight in the morning and I've also found a place where we can spend the night. And he says, don't worry about it. We're not going to miss our flight. Well, we arrived in Cleveland 30 minutes after our flight to Milwaukee was scheduled to leave. And so now we're already 30 minutes and we're still on board the plane. We're not even in the, you know, in the terminal at this point. We took a tram to the adjacent terminal, and when the door opened up, John took off running like a homesick deer. And uh, he was running down that long corridor. And I'm thinking as he is running, why run? We're stuck here for the night anyway. Besides that, I felt like I refused to run and have a heart attack, uh, only to find an empty gate once we would run that distance. And uh, as we were walking towards and running towards that gate, we heard them paging for passengers John and Jerry Brooks. They were holding the plane for us. Now, there was only two seats left, and the two seats that were left in the plane were far at the end, way back towards the rear of the plane, near the restrooms. And as we boarded, having held the plane up for all of this time, uh, to say the least, we kind of got the stink eye from everyone as we were making our way down that, um, that aisleway trying to find our seats. And it was as though everyone was saying, just who do you think you are holding up the plane like this? Well, finally, we got to our seats. I collapsed into my seat and I leaned over and I said to John, there's no way our luggage will ever be on board with this tight of a connection. When we arrived in Milwaukee, which we finally did that night, miraculously, I went to the luggage carousel expecting to find nothing. However, as I looked, I saw there it was. Our luggage had made it as well. Now, why do I tell you this story? I'm telling you this story simply to let you know that all of my worrying was for absolutely nothing. All of my fretting, all of my planning, all of my attempts to micromanage our time and what was going to happen next meant absolutely nothing. It was all out of my control. You see, worrying always claims the worst possible outcome. The kids are five minutes late home from school. Either they missed the bus or there must have been an accident. A nagging cough. I'm sure it's coronavirus. And, you know, I'm the next one to get laid off. I know that the furlough is going to affect me this time. And as a result, what is going on in the economy, I just know I'm going to lose my home. I'm going to lose everything that I've worked all life long for. 
You know, friends, I've come to believe that worrying is actually then a sin. Let me tell you why. Here's why. Because worrying takes our focus away from God and places it on our perceived circumstances. And I say perceived circumstances because we honestly do not even know how to ascertain what our circumstances are at times. Worry and anxiety and nagging obsessive thoughts about events and situations about which we have no control, things that are beyond our control. And so whether we like to admit it or not, at heart, most of us are control freaks. We love to be in control. We love to, you know, control what's going to happen in our day and what's going to happen in the month and the year and what's going to happen at a certain roadway point in our life, whether it's uh, retirement or moving to a new city or whatever. We love to be in control. You see, anxiety results from our inability to control and micromanage the circumstances of our lives. I believe worry in the life of a Christian is the residue. It's what's left over from our old nature. You see, since the fall of Adam and Eve, mankind has taken upon themselves the role of making things happen, or at least we think we're making them happen for ourselves. Here's the point that Jesus is making then in Matthew chapter 6. That rather than worrying, we need to trust God. Listen to what it says here in this familiar portion of Scripture in Matthew chapter 6. Starting with verse 25. Therefore I tell you, this is Jesus speaking now. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. He's going to use an example now. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? You see, Jesus knew the value that God places upon man. And so he wanted to emphasize and reemphasize one more time that human life As as valuable and as exciting all life is, that human life has a greater value to God than any other form of life on this planet. Are you not much more valuable than they are? Referring to the birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? He said, what will worry do for you? Will it add an hour? I think not. Look at verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. Oh, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry. There it is again. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things. Now, the word pagan is an interesting word. You know, it's one that's often used. Somebody's got a a very, you know, uh, a lifestyle that's wicked will say, you know, they're a pagan. Or, you know, we'll just refer to someone's pagan lifestyle. Here's what a pagan truly is in the true sense of the word. A pagan is somebody that does not know that God exists. And therefore, the pagan will worship, you know, a a rock that's been carved or uh, some kind of an idol, believing that it is their God or worshiping the sun or the moon or something else. The pagans run after these things. Those that live a worrisome lifestyle that are worried about what they're going to eat and what they're going to wear and what the next day is going to hold, Jesus said, these individuals are living as though they do not know that God exists. And he says, your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He knows our needs. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, 
These are the words of Jesus, remember. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, worrying is counterproductive in every category. You see, worry is a thief. It robs us of our peace. It robs us of our joy. It robs us of our sleep at night. And therefore, it robs us of our strength. Remember, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And someone that is worried and is fretting and is full of anxiety is often making plans and they're trying to make things happen that are out of their control. Friends, it's so good to know that God loves us, God cares, and that God has a plan. Not only the big plan for the end, but he's got a plan for every single day of our life. And the thief would come to rob, kill and destroy, which is the enemy. That is the devil. And it comes and he comes to rob us of our peace, our joy, our sleep at night, and hence our strength. So then what is the key to living in victory? What is the key to living in victory over anxiety and over worry? Let's go back to our text now one more time. Look at verse 6, Philippians 4 and verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I love the way the Living Bible paraphrases verse 6. It says it this way. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs and don't forget to thank him for his answers. I believe that we need to embrace the truth about God. And there are very many truths about God, of course, but there are two that I believe are most important here. The first one is that we must embrace the truth that God is good. At times, we will not understand the twists and the turns that we're taking in life and what is happening and what is surrounding us in the realm of of trials and troubles. But when it's all settled, when the dust is settled, you will know, and I always know as well in that moment, when it's over, many times not in the midst of it, but we can know that God is good and that he is working all things ultimately together for our good. So we need to remember in the midst of whatever we're facing in life, number one, God is good. And secondly, we need to understand and remember that God is trustworthy, that we can trust him with our lives. We can trust him with our finances. We can trust him with our health. We can trust him with our children. We can trust him in all the categories of life. Those categories of life, even that we try to micromanage and then realize we cannot. So God is good, and God is trustworthy. Now look at verse 6 one more time. Do not be anxious or worrisome or fretting about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Let's unpack that phrase by phrase for a moment. First of all, I love that first phrase that says, do not be anxious It literally means to be filled with foolish concern, with troubled thoughts, and with worried minds. Do not be anxious. Now, the Bible simply says, this is a command to us. Do not be anxious. No matter how the natural inclination may be, no matter how you may feel like your body's responding, even your natural instincts are responding, The word of the Lord says, do not be anxious, do not be filled with foolish concern, troubles, or worry. And the Bible says, do not be anxious about the next phrase there, notice now, about anything. I've looked that up, and anything means anything. I want you to notice all throughout here, this is going to be all inclusive about anything. Do not be anxious, do not have concern, be troubled, or worried about anything. 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 
and that anything means absolutely anything or nothing, but in everything by prayer. So the Bible says not to worry, not to be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer. Now that word that is used there for prayer is not speaking of petition yet. It will get there in just a moment. However, at this moment, it's talking about our devotional life with God. It's communicating with Him. Friend, let me tell you, there's no better way to start out the day than to start your day with God. And as you're going through the day, there's no better way to spend your day than spending it with God. God wants to live with you, wants to walk with you. He wants to go where you go. He wants to help you in whatever your endeavors are in life. So, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer, devotional, it's your communication, it's your talk with God. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. Now that doesn't mean to go into the closet and close the door and never come out, but rather, and there may be moments like that, but for the general populace, for most of us, it means that there's a prayer that's being offered up continuously from us. Then the Bible says, petition but in everything by prayer and petition. Petition is those special times of need. In those moments, you can run to God and you can pray out, Abba Father, Daddy Father, just as we've walked in the good moments of life and we've built relationship in those moments. I need your help right now in special times of need. That is petition. And then he says, the way that we are to bring our petitions before God is to bring them with thanksgiving. Now, it's very interesting, the word that is used there for thanksgiving. It's actually Eucharista, and it sounds familiar to many of you right now. Eucharist is that which is a celebration of the Lord's Supper in many, many churches. Mainline churches use that term often. Evangelical churches very seldom call it the Eucharist, as they do in high church and many of these other denominations. But nonetheless, the word Eucharist or Eucharista, here's what it means. It means to look back at previous answers to prayer. So in the Eucharist, when we're taking the Lord's Supper, we're looking back. We're looking back to the cross. We're looking back to what happened, how he gave his life for us. And on the third day, he rose again. And how he lived among us for 40 days, how he ascended to the Father. We remember that. And because we remember, we also know, just as we look back, we can look forward to the day he's going to return. So the Bible says, then we make our petitions and our prayers are offered up with thanksgiving, which is looking back. I want you to look back for just a moment. Think of all the times that God has answered your prayers. How many times you are frustrated and you had no answers, but God came on the scene and he helped you in a supernatural way financially or physically, emotionally, in your home, in your marriage. It could be with a test that you had studied for and you just were all flustered about how it was going to go in all areas and all details of life. I want you to think back. God has been so good. Remember, God is good and God is trustworthy. And so we bring our petitions to him with thanksgiving. He's done it before. He's come through in the past and he is going to do it again. So the Bible says then, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That is specific requests for specific needs. God loves to hear us pray, and he loves to walk with us, he loves to speak with us, and he loves to hear the specific needs of our life. Because when we're specific about our prayers, it identifies the fact that we believe that our Heavenly Father cares, that our Heavenly Father is hearing, and that our Heavenly Father is going to come to our aid. And so I want you to know, you can pray specifically. Whatever that burden is that you're carrying, it could be for a wayward son or daughter. It might be for your health. It can be for... You know, situations of every kind that we face in life, whatever it is, I want you to know that you can deal with this and bring it to God. Bring your specific requests, present your requests to God. Now listen what will happen. If we're not anxious about anything, bringing everything in prayer before Him, 
making our requests known to God with thanksgiving. Listen to what the promise is in verse 7. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And the peace of God, think about that for a moment. The word that is used there can also refer to a smile. And in this case, the smile of God. You know, friends, when God smiles down on us, it brings incredible peace. I want you to know God loves you. God cares about you. And as he looks upon you, my prayer is is that when he looks upon any of us, it brings a smile. You know, when our children were small, we would love to go into their bedroom and stand at the end of their crib, waiting for them to awaken in the morning. And we could not help but stand there with a smile upon our face, even though they were unaware of it because they were not awake yet. I want you to know God smiles down on you. You know, there's something about a smile. A smile always quiets our heart. When you pass somebody on, you know, a sidewalk or, you know, going through a store and and they smile at you, it's something about a smile that just lets you know it's okay. They value you. They think about you. And I want you to know the peace of God is literally the smile of God upon your life. And the Bible says that smile, that peace of God, transcends all understanding. It goes beyond our cerebral comprehension. There will be times when you will sense the peace of God, the smile of God upon your life, and it will actually be in moments where you will say to yourself, I'm not even sure how I can have peace in this moment, but I have a peace that the world never gave me and the world in situations cannot take away. You sense the peace of God. And the Bible says, he will guard. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard. It's a military term here that's being used to signify a sentinel that's guarding a city. You know, cities of time of antiquity, there were walled cities for the most part. And the most vulnerable part of any city was the gates. And there at the gate, they would place a sentinel. And the sentinel was there to alarm if any harm was coming their way, and to call the army into action. And so it is here. It's going to be a military guard sent by God himself. And what is he going to guard? He is going to guard your hearts. He's going to guard your will. He's going to guard your affections. And the Bible says not only will he guard your hearts, but also your mind and your minds. That is your cognitive process of reasoning and of understanding. He is going to guard your thoughts. You know, many times, the harder we say to ourselves, don't think that, the more our mind seems to just kind of go off on a tangent and begins to fixate on things we don't even want it fixated on. The Bible says he's going to send a guard. And I believe he's going to guard the gate. And the gates of our lives are our eyes and our ears. What comes into us from all of these areas of life, he's going to guard us in that moment. He's going to guard even the very processes of our thinking. And then he says, all of this is in Christ Jesus. You know, in Christ Jesus, that phrase is one of Paul's favorite expressions. You know, it's a marvelous thing to know that We can be in Christ and that Christ can live inside of us. You know, it was Jesus himself that tells of how in the the book of Revelation, and uh, this revelation was given to John, Behold, I stand at your heart's door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come into him. Notice that position. I will come into him. Let me tell you why I'm sharing what I'm sharing with you today in this particular message. I have sensed the Holy Spirit this past week giving me direction, saying, there are far too many of his children that are living lives of frustration. Some of you, as you see, all of things around that have been idled for so long and and businesses, businesses that have been shuttered. And there's been kind of an anxiety, a worry. What's the next step? Is it safe to go back to work? Is it safe to put my children back into daycare? 
And there's all these questions, these questions about, will my company, will they still be there by the time I get back? Will I be working from home? Will I be working back in the office? And if I go back to the office, will it be a safe environment? And, and there's so many questions right now that are flooding the minds of so many. And I believe the Lord God himself is saying, I have a place for you. I want to be in you and I want you to be in me. It's all found in our relationship with Christ Jesus, the peace of God that passeth all human understanding will keep our hearts and will keep our minds. And I will, in these moments, I'll remember, you know, all the frustrations that have been around and about and how all of that frustration brought about worry and fret. But in the end, all the worrying, all the fret brought nothing. And Jesus is standing right there and saying, let me, let me come alongside. And better than that, allow me to come in and I will be with you. I am good. I am God. And the things that cause you worry, I can work. I can work all of that for your good. Leave it with me. You can trust God. God cares for you. The Bible tells us he knows the numbers of hair upon our head. He knows when we rise up and when we sit down. He knows us and he loves us. If you've never given your life to Christ, that heavy load that you're carrying right now, you were never meant to carry. And I want you to know you do not have to carry that load unless you choose to live life without Christ. But in choosing to live life without Christ, you're taking all of this upon yourself, which is going to rob you of your peace, of your joy, of your sleep at night, and your strength during the day. And Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'm going to give you rest. It's time to turn over your life and to turn over all the frustrations of life to the one that created you, knowing that he's got a plan for your life. Cast your cares upon him. He cares for you. If you've never given your life to Christ, this is a wonderful time to do it. Just say, Jesus, I give you my heart and I give you my life from this moment on. I allow you to come into my life, bring your peace, I'm so glad that you are a loving God, a caring God, and that you are a powerful God. And when I put my trust in you, I can know it's well placed. Give your heart to Christ. Now as families, I want to do, I want to pray for you. It's possible there's been frustration and the frustrations have been rising up. And there's anxiety and there's worry, there's fretting about so many things of what the new normal is going to look like and what daily life is going to look like. Friends, we may not know, but God does. And he's the one that's going to lead you, guide you, cast your cares upon him. Let me pray for you right now. We take the hand of a family member that's nearby. And if you're alone and maybe there's no one else in the apartment or in the house alongside of you, Again, I want to remind you, you're not alone. Christ Jesus is right there with you right now. And I want you to sense his presence and your, his touch upon your life. Let me pray for you. Father, Lord, as family members are uniting together, taking the hand of a loved one, someone they're doing life with right now in their home, Thank you, Lord, for the invitation to cast our cares upon you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you'd be willing to come into this world and experience life here so that when we ask for help, you would know exactly what we're asking for because you would have experienced the same. Thank you, Lord, that in all of your experiences, the Son of Man amongst men 
You never sinned. You never failed. And we're so glad, Lord, that you're the one that comes along, gives us strength. Strength, Lord, to be able to face a new day. Help us, Lord, to realize that we can't add one single minute, moment or second to our life by worrying or fretting. It only robs us of the moment. I pray the peace of God upon each member of this family as they hold hands together. Lord, I pray for the aged that may be all alone, some watching from hospital beds, some uncertain about tomorrow. Lord, I pray you just give them a hug from heaven. Help them, Lord, to know you're with them, you're for them, and that you love them. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen.